Hey everybody, this is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. And JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These monthly broadcasts lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our executive networking event, the Telecom Exchange, or TEX. And new for 2019, we are now quarterly with our TEX events. So next one up is TEX Dallas. Just one month from now, that's a pop-up afternoon event, March 13th, where we're going to be talking 5G to the edge. And then we're back in Hoboken for our ninth annual TEX New York in May 14th to the 15th. So go ahead and mark those calendars. More info at thetelecomexchange.com. So let's get started. An exciting topic today, an amazing lineup with my friends here. Can the internet break? We are talking network infrastructure needs, opportunities, and predictions. Again, we have a C-level roundup from four absolutely innovative companies. Joining us today, weighing in, Miss Amy Marks, CEO of Excite Modular. Mr. Gil Santelis, CEO of NJFX. Nigel Bailiff, CEO of Aquacoms and Vinay Madcow, president of Interglobix. Guys, welcome, welcome. Such a great topic with such great thought leaders. Thanks for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started with introductions. So go ahead and tell our viewers a little bit about your companies and your unique position in the network infrastructure space. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with Gil. Great, thank you for having me, Jamie. So NJFX, as many of you are aware, is the US's first carrier neutral cable landing station campus. And we established it in 2015 as a place where subsea operators could safely land their subsea systems. We did it in a way that would allow for market opportunity for carrier neutrality, which really breeds a marketplace. So today, NJFX stands with three existing subsea systems live in the facility. It's the original two TGN networks that Tata developed back in 2004, which they bought from TE Subcom. CBROS has landed its capacity here at NJFX. Uh, Telecom Italia and Seaboard and Tata all have capacity on that CBROS cable. And we're also welcoming the Hofru system that'll be joining us later this year. The last cable that I would mention is the Wally cable, which is due to come in sometime in 2020, 2021, which is a very unique system. It's a system that's going to interconnect Long Island with New Jersey, having the option to bypass New York City. Thanks, Gail. Nigel? Hi there. I'm Nigel Bailey from the CEO of Aquacoms. Aquacoms are an independent submarine cable developer, builder, and operator. We have an existing cable from Long Island to the west of Ireland, followed through to Dublin, and connected over to the UK and the rest of Europe uh, by a highly reliable system that connects us to Wales. We're building three new cable systems this year. One is we're working with the consortium here, Team Hafru. Our portion of that we call America's Europe Connect 2. We're building a second cable across, which actually goes to Denmark from Gill's building. Uh, and calls into Ireland along the way. We're also building across the Irish Sea, again into uh, the UK, and across the North Sea, which runs from the northeast of England, Newcastle, up to um, up to Denmark. So we'll have this North Atlantic loop of brand new submarine cable uh, facilities. We're, we're a private company, and we operate on a very uh, neutral, carrier neutral, and operator and, and uh, space neutral um, basis. I love to hear about that carry neutrality, always a good thing. Vinay? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Vinay Nagpal, uh, president of Interglobix. Uh, we're a global solutions and consultancy firm primarily focused on the convergence of data centers, uh, subsea fiber and terrestrial fiber. Uh, my background is primarily data centers and uh, connectivity services. And as we have noticed, there is a natural convergence of uh, data centers and subsea fiber taking place. And what that's leading to is, uh, you know, ability to build an ecosystem where you have terrestrial fiber and potentially eyeball networks and CDN providers and uh, SDN providers, IXPs, the internet exchange points kind of co-located in a single place to build that ecosystem. And that's uh, primarily what our firm is focused on. And talking building ecosystems, Avi? 
Hi, my name is Amy Mark. I'm the CEO of Excite Modular. We are design builders of steel and concrete modular critical infrastructure buildings. So that's including cable landing stations, edge and micro data centers, as well as some larger data centers, um, PFE shelters, and ILA hubs. And we're really, uh, I'm, I'm the woman on the panel and I own a construction company. So that's basically, you know, we're really on the infrastructure side. We've got the, we've got the muscle on the infrastructure side on the dry side of the business. Um, I'm also the uh, chair of the working group for Suboptic on diversity and inclusion and a co-founder of the Women in Subsea. So I would say that probably sums up my company, but we build all over the world. Um, based out of here in New Jersey, we build everything in the United States and we ship everything out overseas. And I think we've just been awarded our 30 third cable landing station in that space. Um, and uh, we're pretty proud of our, our, our prolific build program around the world. So really we have perspectives uh, globally with uh, Nigel across the pond and, and Vinay actually tuning in from India uh, today uh, with us um, and, um, and our East Coast, West Coast representation uh, in North America. Um, but um, to this topic, we're really talking about you know, what happens when and if the internet doesn't work? Um, presently, the internet is threatened by many of the legacy submarine cables that connect continents, but are nearing the end of their life cycle. New cable installations desperately needed, particularly as the industry looks to data intensive next gen technolo technological advances like 5G, IoT, and AI that all require this support of immense bandwidth. Which brings me really to our, our first question here. How are these data intensive next gen technologies like 5G, IoT, basically all the headlines we see these days, how are they affecting the current cable conditions and installations? Vinay, would you like to kick this off? Sure, um, Amy, uh, uh, Jamie, absolutely happy to do that. I mean, I spent the last few days uh, here in, uh, in New Delhi, in India, primarily uh, at the Capacity India event and then the Data Cloud and the recurring theme has been the amount of data being produced around us um, and the next-gen technologies such as um, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning, and what the impact of these technologies is to us and the industry. Um, I think it's phenomenal if you think about it that 90% of all the data that exists today has been created in the last two years. So if you think about it, kind of what lies ahead for us is, uh, is, 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 to me, it's inconceivable in terms of where we are headed from a data growth perspective. Uh, and these uh, cutting edge technologies are only leading to uh, more data generation. And to support that, there is uh, newer technology, whether it's increasing the number of uh, fibers and terrestrial and subsea cable systems, or having better optical systems to have higher capacity uh, wavelength systems put together. Uh, to give you an example, I mean, the Maria cable that spans across uh, from Spain to Virginia Beach, when it was uh, announced, it was 160 terabits per second system. I say that when it was announced because today now it's already uh, over 200 terabits per second system. Uh, and that's the highest capacity to cross the Atlantic. So there's that phenomena taking place, and then you have on the physical layer side, the amount of fiber strand increasing on both the terrestrial and subsea side. So I think the, all of these you know, kind of components are going hand in hand to support the additional data growth. Right, and, and Nigel, what are you saying from, a, from that subsea infrastructure side? Yeah, I think um, the technologies themselves aren't, they're, they're, they're driving demand so they're driving a volume demand and they're driving a slightly different specificity so they're saying that the the mapping of submarine cable routes now on somewhere like the atlantic which is a very old it's the oldest market right the first cable, 1866 um they are much more resilient paths so what we now have is a cable going into denmark a cable into ireland a cable into the uk france spain and that's hundreds of kilometers between those landings. Previously, there was a big concentration and a lot of the traffic went into the south, southern part of the UK in that Cornwall strip there, all very, very closely together, but all, all very vulnerable to a similar event. You know, if, if some event caused a, uh, the cutting of one cable, it might have cut several cables offshore. So I think 
the fact that this is such an essential part of everyday life, everything, every banking transaction, every every social media post, everything needs to use this infrastructure um, across oceans and, and, and underneath oceans. It's changing the way it's deployed. It's now deployed in a resilient basis. People have multiple, uh, you know, use multiple cables. They don't just have one of their own and maybe one of their friends they borrow. So the, the structure behind the industry has changed based upon the requirements. And the requirements are you cannot be totally out. There has to be uh, the ability to pass this data. 5G, 5G increases massively the amount of capacity that's available to the end user, but that will also flow through in terms of end users wanting to do access data, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of miles away um, instantaneously. It's not just about the speed of the last mile, it's about the ability to get hold of data from all over the world and concentrate it for a particular application. So, you know, I can see I can see the edge side of things as well with IoT, a lot of compute at the edge, but a huge portion of this has to travel across the ocean. So we're seeing bigger cables, as Vinay points out, constant drive to get more from the existing cables and new cables and always, always, always more. Still, you know, still looking at 40%, 41% doubling every two years, 41% compound growth. Wow, wow, Gil, that's what you're seeing down in Wall Township? So, so I would agree, just returning from the Submarine World Conference in London yesterday, many topics were discussed and, and obviously the most vulnerable part of a subsea system is that transition from the wet plant getting to the SLTE and across. And what we've done at NJFX support that in terms of providing a safe environment to transition your cable from an SLT environment to not only one backup provider, but lots of backhaul providers to provide that capillarity at the edge, at the cable landing station, where you can actually jump off across seven different terrestrial fiber systems, getting back to that compute. The computer is where all the action really happens when it comes to taking that data, doing the mining for it. And if you think about what's really growing the internet and, and growing this traffic, it's the, the, the revolution of machine to machine. You know, it's only a few years ago when all this traffic was about phone calls and faxes. Well, today it's really machines trying to learn from each other about data points that are being created. You know, someone gave the example of Boeing landing a plane in Frankfurt and over a million parts are gonna communicate once that plane lands on how that seven hour flight did. And they're gonna learn when so the flight takes off again two hours later, how to make sure that plane is ready again for takeoff and it will fly more efficiently. Race cars are, are having races at a certain speed beginning of the season. And by the 10th race of the season, they're, they're, they're going 20% faster. How? Because they're learning. All the points are being measured and being understood. And that's an incredible amount of data that's being created. And it's a data, it's a data point that's not local any longer. It's really an international data point. A car will race in Monaco. It'll be studied in Switzerland. It'll be computed in Ashburn, Virginia, and then it goes back and forth. So it's a dynamic time for us as a civilization looking at how data affects how we interact with machines. Yeah, yeah. and Amy, on the dry side and construction, how are these technologies changing the way you build? Yeah, I think, the, you know, the, the gentlemen on this panel, as they're saying, things are getting more and more complex and the, you know, the capacities are growing larger and larger and we're getting, we're not talking about a couple of cables now. And I think Nigel touched on it as well that, you know, finally, just like the CISRC report pointed out, I think that, um, you know, was written up a few years ago, that really we, we, we have to look at diversity. We need to start looking at better resiliency for these systems. We need to understand, um, you know, how to have, these, we're looking at really a disaggregated distributed internet now. We're not looking at these giant monolithic data centers, although there's still some of those out there, obviously, and they will still be built. You know, as you want lower and lower latencies, every time I pick up my phone and I want to open up an app or every time I'm in an industrial, you know, um, some sort of piece of equipment or I want them in healthcare, whatever that is, as Gil said, all this information needs to go somewhere. It needs to be traveling everywhere and it needs to be in short, the shortest amount of time especially if you're talking about real time. And so that means the buildings that we're building on the infrastructure side are getting a little bit more and more complex. 
So, um, you know, especially in some of these areas where there aren't necessarily data centers even anywhere close to where people are, are, are passing information. So I think on the infrastructure side for us, we're seeing, unlike a couple of years ago, a few years ago, where people were, you know, projecting that we, there were, the CLS will go away and will only go directly to these big data centers that exist, is actually really the opposite. You know, we're having more and more um, proposals for larger and larger cable landing stations that are hybrid cable landing stations and data centers. Or if there is a data center there, we're looking at, you know, all of the edge data centers that are going to be surrounding themselves around those data centers. Um, in a very distributed format. So I think, you know, the buildings are becoming more and more complex. They're becoming more part of an ecosystem as really just a part of a landing point, right? So they're just integrated to lots of other different systems. And, and I think that's the convergence discussion that, you know, Vinay and I have had in the past, that if you think you can just put this in any old building anymore, like sort of the older developers used to do, wherever there happened to be a building at that landing point, those days are over. That's like you were building at that point in hospitals, like a, a day clinic, and now we need to build, you know, hospitals that can actually do complex surgeries, right? So I would make that analogy for what we're doing in the cable station and the data center side. These are these are not the uh, the buildings of old, if you will. Yeah, yeah, not the buildings uh, of old, not the cables of old. Um, but just one quick question, maybe I'll just uh, direct this to Vinay as um, uh, sort of an analyst uh, of our space here. Um, Vinay, what is the current need for, for new cable systems? I mean, are we talking like we need to double the amount of systems that are in place currently because they're all uh, about to good night? Or do we need only like half more? Or are we going to, um, can the technology, and you sort of talked about this in your, your first answer, can technology extend the life cycles on existing cables? Are, are the new cables like, um, Maria, you know, uh, are, how long will their life cycle be, knowing that this exponential rate um, of bandwidth consumption is growing every day? What are you seeing as, as current need for, for new? Yeah, so um, I think Nigel kind of touched upon this, that the average uh, age of a subsea cable is anywhere from 20 to 25 years. Many of the systems uh, crossing the Atlantic that land in Long Island at the moment are nearing end of life. And if you look at, you know, one of the before and after uh, pictures of what the subsea landscape is going to look like over the next uh, five years, it's very different from what it is at the moment. And that's going to be a com combination of these newer systems being put in place. And as you have the newer systems put in place, of course, they're going to be, you know, leveraging the latest technology out there. And many of these systems are also using the, their, what, what's called as an open access system, like Maria, we talked about earlier. So from that perspective, you know, you have, and if you have an eight fiber pair system, for example, and you have the capacity divided up between a few players, they independently can have different vendors equipment at both the ends and they keep upgrading that equipment as the technology evolves. So you have the lit capacity increasing there. You have the dark fiber capacity in terms of, you know, more fiber strands packed in there. Uh, but then also at the same time, if you look at the major OTTs and also what I call as the new aid subsea companies like Nigel's and, are, you know, like Aquacom and others, um, you know, they are investing pretty uh, heavily into these new systems. So I think from a, from a trend perspective, we'll see that continue and the hyperscalers and their investment will, uh, will continue to evolve. Uh, to give you an example, the Maria Cable, when it was uh, put in place, it was Microsoft, Facebook and Telsius. And recently Telsius announced that Amazon, AWS is taking one pair to go from uh, Spain, uh, from Bilbao, Spain to uh, Virginia Beach. I mean, ultimately, they're going to connect their, uh, you know, their cloud platforms. But the point being that um, most of the OTTs are trying to leverage these new systems and then deploy their own, uh, you know, lit services technology and the latest equipment at both the ends to maximize the, the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And in talking, um, are these new cable builds, and uh, Nigel and Gil, I'll, I'll turn to you here. 
what are the, what is the current status? What are the timelines? I mean, we've been uh, have we been able to pick up speed in terms of new rollouts? I remember being uh, part of Hibernia Network's uh, uh, five-year process uh, in, in building out uh, their Hibernia Express cable, and then Morea comes along past that. Of course, it helps to have OTT funding and backing. I think that cleared up a couple of years right there. Um, but um, but still, the process is so arduous of subsea bills. I mean, you literally have boats crossing the Atlantic, rolling out fiber, burying it as it gets closer to the shoreline. I mean, are we are we uh, still uh, still? There's so much to be done, and it seems like there's a, a, a terrible urgency. Have have timelines and technology made this all happen uh, faster? Are we able to get to market faster? What's our current status here, Nigel? There's a there's a fairly standard time, and the, 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 you know the reason is you 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 look at this you you're making this. It's a complex product. It has fine as a human hair fiber optics. It's carried in a protective tube. You have to sort of secure supplies of copper and cable and oil-based product polyethylene for insulation, and then high tensile steel to protect this in the harsh marine environment. You're not making pieces this long. For Havfru, we're making a piece 7,900 kilometers long, 5,000 miles long. So in a factory, we're wrapping all of these things together and joining them with perfect precision because this is going to go three, 4,000 meters down on the seabed and has to stay there for 25 years. There's no way we can pop out every weekend and make sure it's all okay. It's buried on the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Liability engineering and you know the, the work that companies like Subcom have done over the years to make this process you know efficient still does take a long, long time. So you're talking about minimum of about nine months of manufacturing process. And then if you come back from manufacturing, you have to survey the seabed, you have to send a ship. It's going to map every meter of the seabed all the way down to the bottom to make sure you know you're not putting the cable in a hazardous place. And prior to that, you have to go and talk to governments. We all know how exciting governments are at the moment with both sides of the Atlantic having all kinds of fun on a daily basis. But you have to talk to governments, to military, to landowners, and you have to get permits and permissions to be able to even start the survey. So actually, you know what, it's pretty tough to try and build anything in less than two years if it's more than two or 3,000 kilometers long. And I would say if you get all of your economics right, all of your financing right, and you can sign on the dotted line to say, please go and build me this, you're still talking two years for an Atlantic cable and a couple hundred million dollars, right? It's not, it's not a simple job. You're not just, you know, doing a very short, a piece of, uh, of activity in a particular jurisdiction. Multiple governments, parts of the sea that have no government, that's interesting in itself because there's lots of other things down there, oil pipelines, etc. So there's a big, big negotiation. And I mean, we specialize in, in this kind of development and I, I have, and many of my team have specialized in this for 20 years. It's still a big mechanical activity and so you you know five years yes if you're having you know to go through a, a financial justification but even if you had the money in your hand now and you dropped it on the floor uh, or in the reception of, uh, of subcom you'd be looking at a couple of years to get across the atlantic and you know then you end up with this this in the water which will last physically for about 25 years but has an economic life of about 15. One of the reasons there's a lot of building at the moment, people seeing a lot of building of new cables, and indeed Hafru, uh, AC2, which is going to land in, you know, Gill's building about, you know, a week or so into September of this year, and over into Denmark into a building supplied by somebody else on the panel wearing red, then, uh, then, then the, the, the uh, you know, e even, even um, you know, do, do, doing all that, um, gets you eight, ten, however many fiber pairs. We're doing that because 15 years ago, 16, 17 years ago, a whole host of people built a whole load of cables at the same time, and they're all coming up for retirement at the same time. So if you look at GTT Express, 
um, if you, uh, the Hibernian Express cable bought by GTT, AC1, which is our, for our cable into Ireland, then um, the uh, cable, this cable, which is have through Marea, Donant into France, maybe some other cables that are going to run down uh, from maybe northern uh, eastern seaboard down into sort of the France uh, Spain area. You know, all of those things are, um, uh, are are replacing 10, 11, 12 cables that are all pretty much going to come to retirement at the same time. But we've phased it now a little bit. And I think what will happen is that that probably copes with the demand for five to eight years. So then in a few more years, we'll start another project, put another one in. We'll get into a smaller recycle. We'll be doing a new cable every four or five years. We get to a smoother flow, much like other parts of the world. So we're really reaping what happened 15 years ago, um, but we're doing it more cautiously, carefully, and with private capital sometimes and not just carriers uh, combining together to build these things. And Never will, go. Oh, can I interject, Jamie? Just please. the one thing that I heard, I heard Jamie ask, but I didn't hear sort of maybe, I'm reading subtitles potentially. Is It sounds to me, and I know you're not this person on the panel, but it sounds to me like, I don't think we talk in our industry enough about, okay, great. So you held up a cable and you said, maybe you, you're, you've maxed out on like how quickly we can get these cables produced. and that, I'll put that aside for a minute because I'm not a cable expert, as I always say. But I do think what we are missing in the industry is sitting around and collaborating better at understanding how to shorten some of these cycles because of inefficiencies in working together with collaborating with the groups that are important, right? So as an example, you know, like I, I, I last show we were at, not London, but the one before at PTC or who knows, whichever show we were happy to be at. I watched Kent Bressy throw up the average times for permitting, right? And you know, some of them were very short. I think one of my previous clients, uh, or one of our clients at Seaborn, I think it was like 235 days, let's say. I'm just making a guess. And some other guys had on there 500 and something days. You know, and I actually walked up to Kent afterwards and said, why is that? Like, why are some of these so dramatically different? And he said, well, Somebody, some of the people at the top of the list actually are better at answering and being more responsive with the answers to the questions that people are answering them, and some of them are not. So if you're talking about a difference of 250 days, you know, and, and all that took was to potentially be just a little bit better at answering questions and getting being responsive and collaborating amongst probably five different groups in the consortium or 12 different groups or whatever that is. The one thing I really don't ever see us doing in this industry is something almost called like Kaizen, when you look at manufacturing, right? And Toyota just in time. They do something called Kaizen. They look at where the inefficiencies are and they get a cross-functional team together that have no skin in the game for whatever the project is on. And we talk about, all right, where are the bottlenecks? How could we potentially shrink some of these? Where could we gain some concurrencies? And we're not, in my opinion, I'm not a part of it, but I certainly don't hear about them happening. No one's having these kinds of smart conversations, at least across the industry. They're just kind of saying like, Look, the best, of the, and by the way, I would call you well, some of the best of the best, Nigel. You're probably able to cut mm. times better than anybody. But, you know, not everybody is, is your <clears> team. <throat> so we're not really focusing on how we can do better procurement methodologies, how we can do, you know, activities amongst each other that are just better, right? And, and I feel like if you're talking about what we're going to need for these new systems, if you don't address that, we're just going to keep building the same old way we built them. And it's not really that efficient. If I could jump in before we lose time, one of the things that we do at NJFX is help with that process by having spare bores available, getting ahead of the curve, and then working with folks in other locations like Virginia Beach, like Jack Knapp. And what I would leave you with is subsea cables, think of, people think of them as crossing the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific. There's a huge need in the US to have a cable go along the East Coast work with existing sites, develop some new sites, get the permitting done quickly, but there's a crisis going on in the United States with getting traffic up and down the East Coast. Those systems were built 20 years ago also. We take them for granted every day, but subsea festooning is gonna be a huge initiative going forward. You gotta connect. You gotta yeah, connect. That's true, because I think, and it feels right on the money there, because you're trying to get you're trying to get resilience and be resilient points as well as you know new big transoceanics but just to address 
Amy's point there, I mean, that there are some things going on and, and, you know, occasionally Kent's been part of them. The ICPC runs some operations. Yep. One of the issues here is that those, um, those activities are you, you, where, where commercial organizations are engaging with government and, you know, a lot of the, the process is, de is defined by government. I think you, you're right in a way that we don't form up into collaborative teams quickly and well enough. And that was a, a skill we had in the industry back in the old consortium days. Funnily enough, you don't rarely, you rarely hear me, me talking about how good it was in the consortium <laughs> days. You know, frankly, was that people, you know, in our industry could get together. We've now actually got a bigger industry than we ever used to have, you know, a lot bigger. Right. And so it's it's getting those models right. So the, the the economic and management model of how to construct a cable is there. It should yeah. be the easiest in the world. Most of the time, it's like critical infrastructure for a, for a, a nation. So you'd think that many nations would make it easy. Some do, right? And and I'm not I'm not you know laying any any political angle here. But you know Denmark, you basically just turn up and say, as long as everybody's happy from a marine environmental perspective. Tick, 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 you can build a cable. And it costs you like $35,000 or something uh, to get a license to land a cable. And uh, in other countries in the world, and there are some difficult countries, and one of them is the country that, you know, three of you guys are sitting in there, well, apart from uh, me and Vinny, but the, the, the US is, is quite a complex place to do business because you have a devolved government, you have, you know, lots of different organizations that need to have their say, and there's just a, a friction to, getting all of those people lined up. It's it's a process, you know, how long it takes. I would say now, you know, if you were to ask somebody like Kent, you'd probably say it's about a year. And that's way better than it was going back to, I think the system you're talking about and he puts on his slide, which was about seven years ago when it was 695 days. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's improved, but there are still hoops to jump through. And it's not really a mechanical Kaizen that you can apply to because it's about influencing politicians sometimes and also certainly influencing a vast series of, of government departments. Well, I think that's why ICPC is so important, right? So those types of organizations or suboptics, you know, working group on new technologies where we have cross, you know, communication amongst governments as well as all the industry players that can really come together on technology, you know, with Elizabeth's group out there. We need those, but I keep feeling like we're not doing enough to say, you know, okay, so these are the things we can't change. What are the things we can change, right? There are obviously things you're never gonna be able to change with government, but like, what are the things you're going to be able, or less so with government, but what are the things in some of those, you know, four year, three year, two year periods, what are the things we could change? And I rarely hear people talking about some of those. That's all I'm saying. All right, now, and I, and yeah, this I'm is- just gonna add to that what, what Gil was talking about earlier in terms of the need of that festoon cable, I completely agree with Gail. We've had that conversation before as well, especially going up and down the East Coast, right? And um, the Wally cable Gill was referring to earlier, which is gonna go from 1025 connect to NJFX. Um, this is a sample of that cable. This is a hexatronic 96 pair, 192 strand cable as an unrepeated system. So at that point with that type of capacity in the water, you're talking about 192 strands of fiber, you know? as an unrepeated system. So you, you're selling more of that dark capacity. And uh, so I think, I think there is that clearly that, that opportunity for deploying that, um, you know, even for a festoon cable that Gil was talking about, clearly connecting once, once the Wally cable is done, I think it's a matter of time before from Wall to Virginia Beach, there's a festoon cable that gets built. And, I, and to agree with you, for Virginia Beach, going down to Florida is the next spot, too. If you look yeah. at the U.S. terrestrial networks, we've got a log jam. Every carrier is sitting on the same exact right of way. To get across the United States, our political system says you got to get on the federal highway. Well, guess where every cable operator has their cable sitting? On I-95, coming up from New York all the way down to Miami. So a festive yeah. cable is the only relief we're going to get. In, in collaborating with Virginia Beach, 1025, perhaps Jack Knapp, perhaps Miami, we can solve this issue and repurpose yeah. the landing stations to not just be landing cables across the Atlantic, but also along our coast. The same thing will happen on the West Coast too. The best right-of-ways we have are along the ocean. 
and getting these hubs to agree to collaborate with our government ahead of time and put in assets in advance will allow a faster install cycle. Well, and what but, about Gil? I mean, like, look, the big dog, you know, the big elephant in the room, right? We're talking about, no pun intended, Africa. Like, if we don't have this process down, when you need, I don't know, when you're talking about uh, 50, 50 stations at least or something like that, you know, or 100 stations that are probably going to end up being there with a bunch of data centers and all kinds of edge stuff and also big data centers. You know, if you don't have the process down well, how are we going to deploy in underdeveloped markets that actually need this infrastructure as well? So like you're talking about very, you know, uh, involved places in the U.S., We've got, we're, I mean, I think we want our 17th job in the Pacific Islands. I can tell you, like, when we build for something like half room versus, like, when we're in the, somewhere, you know, less, I would say, like, developed than Europe, this process has to work really well. And, like, I, I actually think, you know, you said it best, Nigel, sometimes in those places it's much easier just because people, the more complexity people have seen in the past, they make, they, they look for risk instead of solutions sometimes. Yeah. And we haven't been very good in this industry at, coming up with some collaborative solutions that can be repeated, right? Right, and and there's, a, there's no doubt that we have a lot to learn from our friends over in Norway, how we can streamline our, our conversations, get to action, get to mindful uh, rollouts. Uh, time is of the essence. Uh, that, is, that is certainly uh, something I'm hearing from you guys, and, and diversity is required. So we need to start uh, uh, getting building quickly. Um, so one last thing, I know time is running out here, but I did promise our audience predictions. So I'd like to go around the horn and ask each of you to only give a couple of words, only a couple of words, but uh, what predictions can you make for the future of the internet and our network infrastructure? Are we in good shape here or will the internet really be breaking anytime soon? Um, so predictions, and I'll start with my friend Gil. So unless we start being honest with ourselves on how these networks really work, we're going to have massive outages. I was in London and I was with a carrier who's very sophisticated, who thought all his capacity was diverse, looked at his map, it all came through Long Island, through New York City. We mm -hmm. need to be transparent. We need to be honest with ourselves. We've got to explain to customers, your network is not diverse. Here's how it works. I've seen a lot of those networks. I, I hear you. Vinay? I would say that, uh, Amy, this is going to sound familiar, um, that over the next few years, there's going to be a catastrophic outage at a cable landing station unless, look at the reaction from Amy, unless uh, there are some stringent rules and policies put in place for security of these landing stations that exist. Um, and also, I think we touched a little bit upon earlier upon in terms of, uh, you know, when we were talking about the complexity of um, going up and down the East Coast corridor and looking at how we can potentially replace some of the older system. Well, as it turns out, it's much easier to go in the water versus to go start digging up roads again. But also those older systems are much smaller fiber count. Uh, on the terrestrial fiber side, now we're talking about 6,912 strands of fiber. This is one of the first uh, almost 7,000 strands of fiber cable made in the world. So I think there will be more bigger fiber count cables built in and the newer systems uh, will be deployed both on the terrestrial and on the fiber side, on the, on, on the subsea side. Amy? I think both Gil and Binet, I love the prediction that we talked about at Tech LA. Um, I think I'll stay a little more positive for a minute because I think, Gil, you're right as well. But I think what you're going to see is actually new methodologies to actually get some of these cables done. And what I mean by that are new processes um, in order to collaborate with others. I think you're going to see a lot of new players come into the space. I think just like the OTTs came into the space, we will see others. We'll see some other big dogs. And I think you'll see in the supply chain partnerships here some uh, pretty interesting marriages emerging, and it won't be to the same old, same old people that just aren't going to be doing things differently. So I think you'll see a lot of influx of new players and new partnerships and new technologies. And I think the last thing I'll say is you'll see some stringent standards and specifications that have to do with diversity, redundancy, and hardening of our buildings to start protecting, uh, you know, at least on the dry side of the business. I call it the forgotten infrastructure. I think you'll see that because we'll have some issues. I really hope so. Nigel, do you agree? Absolutely. And I think the, the, the thing that, that tells you that you have to have diversity is 
if that cable that Vinay holds up, one guy with a backhoe takes that out, that's 6,900 people who are screaming up and down. And, and so they, there has to be two routes. There has to be two, you know, one is none and two is one. That's the rule. And, you know, I, frankly, we plan on the basis of losing a landing station, but we plan on the basis of also building it sufficiently. So that's a once in a thousand year event of a meteorite landing on top of it that nobody can predict. Not, you know, we assume that, okay, don't worry, some flaky generator will be fine. So we plan the Rolls Royce, but we also plan the what if uh, it goes away. So resilience, you know, diversity, all of those things, security, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's been shown all over the world that uh, these places are, are fairly vulnerable places. Yeah, definitely. Um, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Thank you guys for your views on the internet and its network infrastructure needs, opportunities, and predictions. Again, our all-star panelists, Amy Marks, Excite Modular, Gil Santelis, NJFX, Nigel Bailiff, Aquacoms, and Vinay Nagel, Interglobix. Viewers, thank you for tuning in. And if you liked today's content, which I, how can you not? This was amazing. Come here, our CEO roundtables live. Again, Telecom Exchange, now quarterly, starting next month in Dallas. Go ahead and check us out. We are trying to fill our C-level speakers now, so check us out at thetelecomexchange.com. And to feature your thought leader here next time on our monthly virtual CEO roundtables, PR at jsa.net. That's it for this Friday. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV. Until our next time, happy networking.